Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. My name is Pastor Andrew F. Carter and it is 6 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. I can see that you guys are fired up in the chat. You guys are ready. You're awake. You're aware. You're alert. You're, you're ready to get this party started. And so am I. Uh, you guys, I definitely missed you all. I know it's only been a week since we last got together, but uh, I, I, I stand by it. I believe that absence makes the heart grow fonder. Uh, and so good morning. And let me be the first to do so. If nobody has told you this morning, let me tell you uh, and be the first. Uh, I love you. And God does too. I appreciate you taking time out of your day, your busy Saturday to spend here with me. Today, we're doing the whole book. Our, our Bible study is based on the book of Song of Solomon, uh, and some might even call it Song of Songs, but uh, it is a romantic and, dare I say, erotic uh, poem in the Bible. It gets Look, it gets a little dicey today. Today, some of the imagery that uh, they're talking about in a King James version gets a little dicey. I was looking over my shoulder as I was reading it. I'm like, I hope that nobody walks in as I'm reading Song of Solomon because, man, it's a, it's a little hot and heavy. But that's what we're going to be talking about today. Love, marriage, relationship, uh, the beauty and sanctity of marriage and uh, really the, the beauty of what God intended and created. Uh, just a few things that I want to do. First and foremost, I just want to thank you guys. Um, I want to thank you guys for your flexibility, uh, your willingness to change, your willingness to grow and to mature. I uh, watch our Thursday throwback videos in the Jeep and I love them. I, I look back at those days that were filled with fire and excitement and uh, even battling with people in the comment section. Uh, and and I, I, I miss those days. I, I remember them um, like they were yesterday, even though they were two years ago. But uh, times have changed. We moved on up out the Jeep, uh, started at the bottom floor. Now we're here uh, in the office and, and things are different. I can't have that same screaming, yelling, passionate energy uh, because I got a sleeping baby and wife literally in the room next door to me. I've got neighbors on each side of me. And so I have to sometimes contain that passion. I've also grown from fighting people in the comment section because uh, I don't believe that. Well, I won't say that. I was going to say there wasn't any fruit, but sometimes it would, the spirit would lead me down a, a rant that would bless you all uh, and would speak to you and even spoke to me. I was rewatching. I'm like, man, that was good. That's, that's good stuff. But we've shifted gears. And so I just wanted to thank you all uh, who still rocking with us, who's still riding with us. Um, your guys' support and your love and encouragement, your prayers, even uh, Carrie, Kyra and I, and this ministry. And it's a beautiful thing to grow because things were never meant to stay the same. What we like to do as humans is we fall in love with a season of life. And because it was good, we hold on to it and don't allow ourselves to grow. Uh, and this manifests itself in people when they relive their glory days. You know, the guy who would have won state if he didn't throw his shoulder out or the guy who, you know, would have went pro if coach would have put him in the game. Uh, you, you also hear this with people who romanticize the past. They hold on to a past time uh, in their life and they keep looking back to it, believing that that was, those are the good old days. That's when times were simpler and not to disagree with that, but I don't want to live in the past. I want to live in the present and the present moment. We've shifted and changed gear. So again, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those of you who continue to rock with me. Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to AC, my sister from another mister out there in the Bay Area, her and her son Emilio. They became new members here on our YouTube as well as India. I just wanted to thank you guys for your love, your support and your generosity. It blesses us and uh, is, is, is really an encouragement to keep doing what it is that we're doing. So thank you all for that. Um, our upcoming schedule, so that you guys know, you're like, what are we doing? Where are we going? Uh, where is this ship sailing? I'll give you guys, I will chart our coordinates. I will give you guys the course tomorrow. I am preaching at Purpose LA 
uh, in North Hollywood. I will be at their church. Uh, they've given me an opportunity to bless them with a word, and I'm excited about that. So if you're in the North Hollywood area, you don't have a place to go to church, uh, meet us at Purpose LA, uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to get after it. And then Tuesday morning, uh, my Q&A video is going up at 530. Those are continuously dying. I might put a fork in it because they are cooked. People are no longer interacting. They're not watching. They're not viewing. And for me, I'm in a season like if it's not bearing fruit, I'm going to cancel it. I'm going to just shut it down. And so uh, I've got a few more in the holster. If they don't do better, um, then I'm probably going to stop that series. So if you like it, then got to go show some love to it. But again, I don't have time for things that aren't bearing fruit. But Tuesday morning, Q&A, 530 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Amen. Um, let's see here. <laughs> what is somebody saying? We are with you, but you are a pastor. You should not leave your flock behind because they cannot keep up. Really don't know what that means. Uh, nobody's left. We're still here. Awesome comment. Uh, don't understand what that means. Nobody has been left behind. Um, and I'll, I want to elaborate on that, this comment. A flock is somebody who follows. Um, I would encourage individuals to get connected to a local church. An online pastor is not going to be able to meet your needs. Many people consider themselves a part of the flock, but don't add any value to the ministry. A flock is a community and a family. It's a fellowship together, right? So if you're not uh, being a generous uh, participant when it comes to the financial part, if you're not adding value through service and volunteering and building the body up, then you're not really a part of a flock. It's more of a parasite. You're pulling and sucking at multiple ministries online to try to fill your cup, but you're not really a part of a flock. And so this pastor is leading a flock for those who are participating and volunteering and serving and uh, being a part of the greater good, right? Um, and so I am leading my flock, the flock that God has put me over. Um, I just want to be very clear. Nobody's being left behind. Uh, we're, we're, we're being intentional with how we spend our time. Uh, Tuesday night, our women's group. 6 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, Thursday morning, we have our throwback video. Uh, Thursday night, we have our Bible study. And then Saturday, we will be back here, coffee and prayer, going through Isaiah's chapter 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Amen. So question to ponder as we're getting into uh, 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 this scripture. Um What's a Bible story or verse that has had a significant impact on your life and why? The verse, so I had two of them. The first one was Hosea is what I wanted to share with you guys. I've been in the book of Hosea. Uh, Hosea is a story about a man who is instructed to marry a prostitute, a woman of the streets who has no intention of changing her life. Uh, he marries this woman and has three kids by her, uh, but her name is Gomer and she is for the streets. She refuses to uh, like give up that lifestyle. She refuses to give in to God. She refuses to just love uh, her husband and her husband alone. And despite her infidelity, her adultery and her wild ways, Hosea loves her and redeems her and covers her nakedness and supports her. And what's crazy is that this is an illustration of God's love for us. God is Hosea. God is Hosea. And we are Gomer. And in the same way, we have prostituted ourselves. We have gone after other gods. We have turned our back on God after he's covered us and loved us and forgiven us and has been with us. And we have turned our back on him. And yet he continues to pursue us and to love us. And that wrecked me. That has wrecked me over the last several uh, days as I, I've dove into that. And it reminds me of his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his grace. God is so good. And what about you? What, what stories or verses have impacted you? Jeremiah 29, 11. I love that. 
I'm going to, I'm going to joy. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, she says, I have connected and sent strangers to RC thinking it was helping them to hang on. I hope I didn't make a mistake. I don't know what mistake you would be making. We have a thriving ministry, a church that loves people, that connects people. That is a community here. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know why that would be a mistake. I don't know uh, what you mean by leaving people behind. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of, of what you're even talking about. Uh, we're here consistently once a week. We have men's group, women's group, Bible studies, in-person sermons. Uh, if I, I don't know. So um, God bless you. Uh, I don't think that it was a mistake. We're loving people. We're encouraging people. Really don't know what you're talking about, uh, about how a pastor is leaving a flock behind. We're still here. So uh, can only pour out so much. The next verse, and if you would like to elaborate, that would be super helpful. So I could address uh, what it is that you're talking about. There's multiple places for multiple people to get connected, to serve, to volunteer, to be a part of what it is that we're doing. Um, but I digress. I did want to share Psalm 103. Psalm 103 spoke loudly to me this morning. Now, follow me. This is a verse, again, answering the question, what's a story or verse that has had a significant impact and this impacted me just this morning. This is out of the paraphrase from the Passion Translation. He says, I bow in wonder and love before you, the holy God. God is so holy. Verse three, listen. It says, you kissed my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I've done. You've kissed my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I've done, regardless of the things that you've done, the mistakes that you've made, the areas where you've missed the mark, God kissed your heart with forgiveness. Verse four says, you've rescued me from hell and saved my life. You saved my life. You crowned me with love and mercy. Verse five, it says, you satisfy my every desire with good things. You satisfy my desire with good things. You've supercharged my life so that I soar again like a flying eagle in the sky. Verse six, you're a God who makes things right. You're a God who makes things right. Verse eight, Lord, you're so kind and tenderhearted and so patient with people who fail you. People like me, people like you. God is patient with people. Your love is like a flooding river. Verse 10, you may discipline us for our many sins, but never as much as we really deserve. That's powerful. We're never punished for, for, for what we've done to the extent of what we deserve, right? That's good. That's so good. So powerful. So, so powerful. He goes on and says in verse 10, you may discipline us for our many sins, but never as much as we really deserve, nor do you get even with us for what we've done. Verse 13, and this speaks because of the newborn baby that I've got in my house. The same way a loving father feels toward his children, that's but a sample of your tender feelings towards us, your beloved children who live in awe of you. The same way we feel about our kids, and our kids can sometimes be grumpy, they can be upset, they can be you know, temperamental. But when you're looking at a child, that same way that a father or a mother feels for that little itty bitty baby in the same way, that's just a sample of God's tender feelings towards us. Verse 14, you know all about us inside and out. There's nothing that is hidden. He knows our, our thoughts. He knows our cares. He knows our fears. He knows our worries. Verse 17 here says, but Lord, your endless love stretches from one eternity to the other. Verse 18, you are faithful to all those who follow your ways and keep your word. God is faithful. Would you guys put that in the comment section right now? Faithful, faithful, faithful. You are faithful to all those who follow your ways and keep your word. Verse 21 says, bless and praise the Lord, you mighty warriors, ministers who serve him well and fulfill his desires. And the last verse says, I will bless and praise the Lord with my whole heart 
Let all his works throughout the earth, wherever his dominion stretches, let everything bless the Lord. Let everything bless the Lord. We are thankful and grateful for his love, for his patience, for his kindness, for his mercy, for his giftings, for his blessings. We are thankful for his discipline. We're thankful for his correction because even in his correction and discipline, it has love written all over it. God is good. Amen. He is good. He is good. It just reminds me. It reminds me of how much he loves us and how thankful I am for, for all that he's done. You know, I woke up this morning just feeling a little overwhelmed, right? Frustrated. It's, it's hard sometimes to fathom how God can use us in spite of us. Right. We're, we're, we are a we are a fickle people. We're a, a hard hearted people. Um, what does the Bible say about the Israelites? They were a stiff necked people. Right. Stiff necked people. So like and, and even in the middle of that, he is so good. I'm also reminded how quickly the Israelites forgot about what God had done for them. He had rescued them. He, he, the Exodus, the book of Exodus talks about how Moses led the people of Israel out of captivity from the Egyptians. And as he's leading them, he parts the Red Sea. He provides food. He provides water. He provides shelter. He provides guidance. He gives them everything that they need. And in the midst of that, they still complain. They still grumble. They forget. They even remind themselves like, gosh, I, even in Egypt, we used to have X, Y, and Z. They, they long to be back in captivity because they forgot the good things that God had done for them on, on, on his behalf and on their behalf. And even us, I found myself this morning, well, God, we don't have a building. God, we're, you know, we're not this. God, we don't have this. God, we don't. I'm, I'm, I found myself complaining and grumbling about the things that we do not have. And I was convicted because I forgot of how far we've come. I forgot his goodness. I forgot the miracles. I forgot about the, the, the ways that he made, the Red Seas that he's parted. I forgot how good he is and the journey that we've been on. And I, I was reminded like, man, I need to get back to, re to remembering how good God is, how good he's been. And, and to not allow myself to grumble over my current circumstances or to forget about what he's rescued me from. He has rescued us from the pit of despair. He's rescued us from the power of sin and death. And he has given us new life. Amen. New life. It's a beautiful thing. So that spoke to me and that answers the question to ponder this morning. Of, of what's a verse that had an impact on your life that impacted me this morning and, and, and restored to me a joy. And uh, it snapped me out of a funk that I had found myself in. Amen. Let's, uh, let's, if you guys are ready to rock and roll, put in the comment section, I'm ready. <sighs> Who's ready to rock and roll? I'm ready. And before we pray, I just I just want to say this. Um, it can be discouraging or frustrating sometimes when you put your faith and your hope in me. But I'm going to let you guys know this. I will fail you over and over as a leader and as a pastor. I will let you down. I will not be there for you every step of the way. The intention of coffee and prayer was and has always been for me to lead by example. Uh, to lead you all in, in a way that demonstrates discipline and consistency. And I want to share with you all that even though we're not doing coffee and prayer live seven days a week uh, or even three times a week, we're down to once a week. I promise you that I'm getting up every day at five uh, at 4 a.m. And I am spending time in my devotions. If you could see a snapshot of what it is that I'm doing, uh, I'm reading one chapter from the Old Testament and one chapter from the New Testament, personal devotions that I'm not sharing with anybody else. Uh, I'm studying for my sermon prep as well as for coffee and prayer. I read two chapters every single day. 
and take notes throughout the week on what we will be talking about in Coffee and Prayer. Uh, on top of that, I'm reading 10 pages from two books right now. Uh, the books that I'm reading are uh, Redeeming Money by David Paul Tripp. And I'm also reading When People Are Big and God Is Small. So I read 10 pages or at least one chapter from both of those books, as well as journaling in my prayer journal and uh, my devotion, his, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. I do that every morning, um, Monday, Monday, Sunday to Sunday, every single day uh, without fail, because it is a part of my routine. It is a part of uh, my devotions. And so my intention has always been to lead by example and then to set you guys free to do the same thing on your own. And uh, many people have been encouraged by that. Many people now have these daily routines of devotion that have blessed them and deepened their relationship and faith in God, but I cannot be here for you every day. My first ministry as a pastor is to my family, uh, my wife and my kids. That is my very first ministry because what would it look like if uh, our, our ministry was tip top shape and I was filling everybody's cup and I was feeding the sheep, but my family was in disarray. And in this season of life, and, and I don't need to explain myself, uh, I pray that you guys know and understand, but in this season of life, with a new baby and a brand new church plant here in the physical realm, things have had to shift uh, for the betterment of the body of Christ here in this city. And so it doesn't mean that I love you guys less or I'm being less intentional. In fact, I'm being more intentional with how I spend my time so that I can pour out into you guys when we do meet together. And so just know that I love you and appreciate you all. And it is never my intention to mislead or to leave you all behind. I'm here and uh, am still available through Slack and uh, the different channels that we've made available for you guys to be in contact with us and the ministry. Uh, but you've got to want it. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace. God, we thank you for the peace that you provide that transcends all understanding. Lord, we pray that as we enter into a time of devotion and study, that you would open our eyes to your revelation, that you would empower us, God, that your word would change us, transform us, and that it would challenge us. Lord, we're up for a good challenge. Uh, we pray that you would open our eyes that you would unplug our ears and that you would soften our hearts. And that the same way that we came into this place, Lord, you would not allow us to leave that way. Uh, you would encourage us to leave in a way and in a manner that is deeper, uh, that is wiser and has a better grasp on your Holy Scripture. And so, Lord, we pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be high and lifted up, that it would be uh, lifted and that it would be magnified. Lord, this is all about you. This is all about you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Uh, do what you do by, by just tenderizing who we are and shaping us and forming us to be more like Jesus every day, obstacle by obstacle, trial by trial. Uh, when we see this opportunity right now, Lord, just to give you the praise, glory, and honor that you deserve, we pray this by the power of the blood and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And a Men. Um, man, God is so good. Listen, the Song of Solomon, I want to break this down. I want to give you guys the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, the book of the Song of Solomon, they believe that Solomon is the one who wrote this, uh, but it's still largely unknown. So we like to make the assumption that Solomon wrote it, being that it's called the Song of Solomon, but it is also known as the Song of of songs. Um, they believe that this is what it's about is a poem about love that is set in the days leading up to marriage and during. Uh, this is, you, you read the Song of Solomon differently than you would read many of the other books. This is a snapshot of kind of a love letter. We're getting a sneak peek uh, into a love letter between Solomon and his bride-to-be. Um, they believe that this was written somewhere between 971 or 931 years before Christ. 
uh, somewhere in the early days, days. So if Solomon wrote it, they believe that it was written in the early days of his reign. Uh, and if that was the case, it would have been written in Israel. And why it was written, it testifies to the beauty of the marriage relationship and it reinforces the values of marriage. Amen. So um, a couple of things as we get started, you know, and we talk about what it's about. Uh, Solomon's song describes a relationship between a bride and a groom. Solomon and the Shulamite woman were about to be married in the king's palace. The woman was a peasant worker and uh, Solomon had taken a fancy to her. Um, I would put here love inside God's guidelines, because as we read and you will read through the Song of Solomon chapters one through eight, it talks about uh, the, the beauty of love inside the boundaries of marriage. I believe that many of us think that God gives us instructions because he doesn't, uh, maybe because he doesn't want us to have fun. But I was thinking of this analogy. If I was walking into a construction site, what I would see at a construction site would be signs that would prevent me from getting hurt. You might see a caution sign, a big yellow caution sign, or you might see a red sign that says, stop, don't go any further. There might even be signs that say, hey, if you're going to go beyond this point, you're going to need the proper PPE, the, pro the proper protective uh, equipment. You're going to need goggles or a hard hat or still toed boots. If you go further than this, you're going, there's going to be a required set of uh, utilities or equipment that you need to move forward. Uh, God created love. God created relationship, but God wants you to enter into relationship according to his guidelines. And there are warning signs telling you, hey, don't go further than this without the guidelines or within the boundaries of marriage, because what's going to happen is you're going to get yourself hurt. And so many people ignore the signs, they ignore the warnings, they, they, they ignore these flashing red lights that are right in front of them, and they move forward only to find themselves hurt, only to find themselves broken, only to find themselves stepping over the guideline, ignoring all of the signs, and then they wonder why they are broken. This is an example and and it talks about the love the kissing the love making the descriptive nature of exploring one another's body and how they're drawn to each other and how they're attracted to one another uh but but again god designed sex god designed relationship but he designed it to be enjoyed within the boundaries of love god says don't have sex before marriage because of the issues that arise when you do too many people are giving themselves away sexually, physically. They're giving themselves to another outside the boundaries of marriage and then wonder why they have trust issues, why they wrestle with their self-worth or value, why they keep settling for less than what God created them for is because they're stepping into uh, the, the things that were designed to only take place in the marriage bed, within the guidelines and the boundaries of marriage. So in chapters one and two, uh, it, it really talks about, you know, God gives marriage as a gift and it's a gift based on unquestioning commitment and unconditional acceptance. Um, the Shulamite is the woman who is being married. The daughters of Jerusalem are like the gals around her and the beloved is Solomon. He is the groom. Um, you read through, you know, chapters one through three, um, Solomon's lover recalls the early courtship days and remembers a dream that caused her uh, to concern Solomon's whereabouts. Um, in chapter two, verse seven, it says, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Um, as I was reading this, like I said, and you guys are reading this on your own, uh, there's a part where they're hyping each other up, right? They're talking about one another's bodies. They're talking about how they enjoy each other. Um, and, and they're describing 
each other in the way that they they see each other he likens um his beloved he says and this would be interesting to say to your wife your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep right which have come up from the washing uh he says your hair is like a flock of goats going down from mount gilead they're they're hyping each other up in verse five of chapter four he says your two breasts are like two fawns twins of a gazelle which feed among the lilies right I'll, ladies and gentlemen i'm not encouraging you to go tell your wife or your husband man your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep that just came up from the washing like you can say hey your teeth are white and they're straight and your breath smells amazing and 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 you know you, you the, the way that they're describing some of these things uh a little descriptive don't go tell your wife your neck is like the tower of david built for an armory uh what they do a great job of in the song of solomon's in the song of solomon is hyping one another up it's important for us inside the boundaries of marriage in your relationship to identify and to verbally call out the things that you're drawn to and attracted to. It, it reinforces this idea of inside a marriage, we are to hype each other up. You know, gosh, babe, your butt looks great in those jeans. Man, you look you look amazing. God, I love how your hair flows. You know, uh, that shirt really uh, shows off your figure. Like it's it's important to reinforce and encourage one another and to keep uh, your relationship fresh by lavishing one another with genuine compliments. Uh, in today's day and age, a lot of people stand by this idea or philosophy of like, you know, I love you. Um, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. And that could be one of the most hurtful things as human beings, we desire and crave uh, affirmation. We desire and crave to be heard or to be seen or to be valued. And this is a reminder uh, to descriptively use our words to build one another up rather than tearing each other down. You know, um, it's it's it, it was interesting as I was reading this, even some of the stuff in verse 16 of chapter four. Uh, <laughs> It says, awake, O north wind, and come, O south, blow up my garden, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Um, that is a very descriptive way uh, of encouraging your partner to come taste of their goods. You know, it's, the, the Song of Solomon is, again, an erotic poem. There's a lot of eroticism and descriptive, like, we're like, okay, your neck is like the Tower of David. Not like, that's not a big compliment here. But in the day and the time and in the context of which this was written, she would know, hey, the Tower of David's this beautiful, long and slender uh, object that that is adorned with beauty. And so likening one's neck to the Tower of David is like, oh, now you're talking that talk. You're talking that language. Oh, my, my teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. Shorn sheep, once they get that wool removed, they're white and they're glistening and they look great. So to compare my teeth to a flock of shorn sheep is like, hey, you got some nice chompers on. You got a beautiful smile, right? <laughs> Bob says, easy, big fella. Look, I am not, I'm, trust me, I was like kind of, didn't really want to preach on this one. Didn't want to share Song of Solomon. Was hoping we could just skip right over it. But uh, here we are talking about some of this uh, erotic stuff that's going on. One of the key elements of Song of Solomon, as you guys are, are reading through it, is the enjoying your spouse inside the uh, confines and the boundaries of marriage your spouse is meant to be enjoyed. Sex is a good thing. God created sex, not for you to flippantly give yourself away to other people. See, the world today tells us, oh, well, you got to test drive the car before you buy it. Uh, you you, you got to take it for a spin. Um, one of the biggest fears that you see in people who are waiting for marriage is, well, if I wait for marriage, what if they're not good in the bed? And it's like, our, our culture is so messed up and twisted and and sick that oh, we like like the way that God designed it is that you shouldn't know what good or bad sex is until marriage. You you shouldn't have a barometer to measure it up against. 
But because we've given ourselves away so early, and I'm not shaming anybody who who didn't wait for marriage because I didn't, uh, it, you shouldn't have a barometer to go, oh, well, I waited and they're not as good as my last six lovers. If you would have waited and followed the guidelines and the boundaries in which God had placed, you wouldn't know what good or bad is. It would be great because it would be the first time that you guys are coming together. We have a skewed vision and idea of what sex should be. Then you add to it pornography and the skewed vision and identity that pornography creates about what sex is or how it should be enjoyed many times. What you're seeing in a pornography and the way that you learn sexual behavior, it doesn't translate to enjoyable, loving, intimate sex within the boundaries of marriage. And so because we're so skewed and because our barometer on what sex should be is so off kilter, we have this weird relationship with sex inside the boundary. Some people will throw away an entirely good spouse because the sex wasn't good rather than coming together and communicating and talking about what each other like and how your buttons should be pushed and what it takes to get the car warmed up. We were meant to enjoy the, the, the pleasure and, and the beauty of sex within the boundaries of marriage. But it's hard to when you've given yourself away to so many people. Again, not here trying to shame, not here trying to point fingers or to make people feel bad. But that's a struggle that I think many of us wrestle with. Uh, is because you could have a great spouse, but the sex might not be as good as previous spouses, but they could have been toxic. They might not have loved you. They might not have valued you. They might not have cared about you. They might not have put you first. You were just another notch on their belt. And because it was good, many times it was good because you were chasing after them. There was a traumatic bond or they did things a certain way. Now you're mishandling this gift of God and a healthy relationship because the sex isn't like it was in a previous relationship, but that previous relationship was total crap. I'm fired up about this because this is something <clears throat> that I think a lot of people wrestle with and struggle with. So we were meant to enjoy uh, our spouses within the boundaries of marriage. Um, as you guys read Song of Solomon, uh, a couple other things in chapters five and six, misunderstandings sprang up between Solomon and his wife. And the bride took steps to heal the marriage breach. Um, the growing maturity in this marriage was indicated by references to friendship and an understanding that Solomon and his bride belong exclusively to each other. But marriage and relationship are going to have ups and downs. It's going to be hard. There's going to be ups and downs, but you have to go back to this foundational level of friendship. Too many people jump into a romantic relationship before ever establishing a baseline friendship. And one thing that I think was amazing is that Kyra and I became friends before we were, were romantically involved. We became friends via social media, two people living in different states. She just seemed like a really dope person who I was like, oh, I think, I think she would be great just to hang out with. She seems fun. She seems outgoing. She's easy on the eyes. She's got teeth like a, a shorn sheep. Uh, that it just got back from uh, its washing. She had a neck like the Tower of David, right? And I was, I was like interested. Obviously, I was physically attracted, but we established a baseline and a friendship before we entered into an official relationship. And, and now our friendship carries us when times are tough, when things are challenging. We get back to the idea of, hey, it's not you versus me. We're on the same team. We're best of friends. Uh, the physical aspect is there, but we have established this baseline of friendship that is able to help us get over some of the issues and the things that we find ourselves facing together. Because marriage has several elements, right? Uh, it says, uh, Love, commitment, sexual desire, admiration, and friendship. As a marriage matures, so does the commitment to resolve problems and to deepen the friendship. One thing that I really appreciate about my wife is her willingness to overlook issues or to settle issues or to address issues and to communicate when things arise. Because we never want to come off as if we don't experience issue. 
Uh, we're two very different people from different sides of the train tracks uh, with different life experiences. And when you put two people who are polar opposites underneath the same roof, issues and obstacles are bound to arise. There's obviously going to be issues, but when you have a friendship, a baseline and a commitment to, hey, we're in this regardless, we're in this together, no matter what, no matter what's thrown at us, no matter what issue, no matter what obstacle, no matter what arises, because we're friends and we're committed to this relationship, we're going to be able to get through it, get over it together because we're not fighting each other. We're fighting life side by side. Amen. <clears throat> um, another thing that the Song of Solomon kind of is about, the Song of Solomon is traditionally considered to be like a love poem again. And he uses marriage as an illustration of Christ's love for the church. Christ's love for the church. The way that the bride and the groom interact, we got to remind ourselves that the body of Christ is the bride of Christ and that Jesus is the groom and he loves us and he pursues us and he courts us and he woos us and he desires relationship, intimate relationship together. The Song of Solomon is uh, a fun book to read. It's not something that I would ever preach out of personally. I might find uh, an illustration um, because she says, I am a wall, verse eight or chapter eight, verse 10. I am a wall and my breasts like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Solomon had a vineyard. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. Um, my vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand and those who tend its fruit, 200. It's, it's a poem. King Solomon knew that the love between a husband and wife should be enjoyed and celebrated. Um, God made human bodies to be enjoyable to their spouses. And so this last little bit of encouragement is, hey, enjoy your spouse, celebrate love, and never awaken these passions outside of marriage and never let anything interfere with your enjoyment. When uh, I'm sharing this. You might be single. You might not have a spouse. You might be married or in a relationship. <clears throat> One of the greatest tips or pieces of advice that I could give you is that establish your relationship with Christ first. The health of your relationship with Jesus will overflow into all of your other relationships. Right? Let me say that again. <clears throat> the health of your relationship with Jesus will overflow into every other relationship in your life. I've shared this before. I'm going to share this again. But if Jesus, the one who died for you, who loves you unequivocally, he, he loves you without boundaries, without borders. He it says that there's no greater love than one who would lay down their life for a brother. If somebody who loves you in your imperfection with all of your scars and blemishes and all of your hurt and pain and all of your imperfections, if Jesus would love you in that way, then that should be the object of our affection. Jesus should be the object of our affection because he loves us without borders. And so because somebody loves us to that extent, we should desire to communicate with him first and foremost through prayer. You got to have a solid prayer life, right? When it comes down to knowing Jesus, it, having a passion and an excitement for his word, you, if you desire to know him, you desire to, to search the scriptures, to know him better and deeper, right? If you're willing to communicate and to know about him and to sit in silence and in prayer and have intimate relationship with Jesus, that will overflow into other into all your other relationships. My relationship with my wife is good because I have a solid relationship with Jesus because she sees my imperfection. She might not love me unconditionally and with border and with boundaries and rightfully so. And that's, that's okay. Uh, because she loves me that way. But because my relationship with Jesus is locked in, I'm able to better love my wife. I'm able to better serve my church. I'm better. I'm able to, to better serve and enter into relationship with all of the people in my life. 
right? So my single people out there, spend time with the Lord. Get comfortable spending time alone with him. Get comfortable on going on prayer dates, on taking yourself out to dinner, just you and Jesus. Stop focusing on being so alone. If you're alone, get yourself locked into a small group. Get yourself locked into a serve group. Get yourself locked into a Bible study. Start surrounding yourself with individuals, men or women, depending on what sex you are, depending, like, like you start surrounding yourself with other people who are pursuing the Lord. Get into relationship with him, get into relationship with other people. And I believe that when you're spending time with him and his people, the right person will come at the right time. And I want to remind you of this. God is not going to contradict his word. God is not going to contradict his word. He's not going to send your person, right? Your person along and they're going to compromise on his word. If, if the man that God is sending you, you, oh, well, God's sending me this man. If he's sending you this man, that man should be leading you in a direction that pushes you closer to Jesus and doesn't pull you further away. What happens so many times is that people get a little bit of attention. Somebody invests a little bit of time. Maybe they, they tell them that their neck looks like the Tower of David. And they're like, oh my gosh, nobody's told me my neck looks like the Tower of David in six months. Uh, this must be my person. And, and so now you've gotten some compliments. You're starting to feel good, but they're pulling you further away from Jesus and encouraging you to compromise your relationship with him. That's not it. We lack so much discernment and then tie God's name to it. This person is pulling you further from your relationship. And just because they go to church with you doesn't mean that that's your person. So now they go to church with you and now all of a sudden they're a man or woman of God. There are going to be people who go to church religiously who might not make it to heaven because you can know the Bible and not know Jesus. Church attendance, right? Church attendance does not determine somebody's devotion and intimacy or relationship, genuine relationship with God. There are wolves in sheep's clothing sitting in steeples, uh, in steeples, sitting in, in, uh, sitting in pews around the world. There are churches filled with people who don't even know what the word says. They go out of tradition. They go out of routine. Well, Sunday's the day that I go to church, but then live like the devil Monday through Saturday. Just because you meet somebody in church doesn't mean that they're a man or woman of God. So it's like we, we got to do a better job of discerning, stop rushing into these relationships, jumping head over heels uh, for these individuals and focus on your relationship with him. It, it breaks my heart to see people going through this pain, this hurt and this heartbreak because they're more concerned uh, with their loneliness than their Lord and Savior. The, the, they're more concerned with not feeling alone than standing on the truth of the word of God that says that you are never alone, that you will never be left and you will never be forsaken. Right. I saw a question that I wanted to respond to. We've got time. Today, it says, what do you do when your spouse seems to be moving uh, away from God and is tempted into daily sin and selfish ambition? Um, the, the thing about that is once you are in relationship, right, once you're in marriage, you're in the bounds and the, 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 the boundaries of marriage, um, your, your mission is to love them, to encourage them, to pray for them and to lead by example. You can't force somebody. But one of the most loving things that you can do is lead by example. And to not allow their behavior to strain your relationship with the Lord. Your steadfastness, your patience, and your unwillingness to compromise will many times uh, convict the darkness that they're living in, right? The light in us illuminates the darkness that others are living in. That's why when you walk into a place where people aren't submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the light in you irritates the demons in them. It irritates the darkness in them. 
And so don't become a nag. Don't, you know, hover over them. It, it often it says in the Bible to, to check the plank or the log in your eye before worrying about the speck in theirs. I know it can be discouraging. It can be frustrating. You know, you're not being led. You can come up with a whole host of things that aren't going well. Um, what would Jesus do in the situation? Because Jesus was patient with us when we were turning our back, when we weren't being, um, when we weren't being committed, when we were being selfish, when we were struggling in our faith, He never left us. And in the same way, neither should you. Now, there's great, there, there's reasons why a marriage uh, can go its separate ways. But somebody wrestling or struggling in their faith, the best thing you can do is to encourage them, to love them, to pray for them, to lead by example, and to to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that relationship. That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. And so, um, as far as the song of Solomon kind of in a nutshell, uh, it, it shows us the freedom and the passion that we are able to express because we are, we're expressive beings we're, we're we were created for that connection. Uh, but, but, it's reserved for marriage. Stop giving yourself away to people who God didn't call you to do life with. We're, we're so quick to give it away. We're so quick to jump into a relationship. We're so quick to title. This is my God sent person. We're so quick to say, this is my, this is uh, my soulmate. Um, but many times you haven't done life. You haven't even established a baseline of friendship with these individuals. Establish a baseline of friendship, establish an intimate relationship with Jesus. Take your time, go slow. I know that, I know that, uh, you know, tax return season is upon us and people are trying to get cuffed up and boot up so they can get a new PS five, knock it off. Stop trying. I know that the summer's coming. I don't stop trying to rush into something that God's telling you to go slow with. If the person that you're with doesn't want to respect your boundaries and wait to have sex until marriage, then they're probably not the one. That means they lack self-control. They lack maturity. They lack relationship with Jesus. If they're pressuring you or forcing you into a situation, if they're willing to go into places that are easily tempting, right? They're inviting you over for one-on-one -on -one time to Netflix and chill run. The Bible says to flee from sexual immorality. If you think for one minute that you're going to enter into the den of sin and you've got enough willpower, like how many of us do that? Oh, well, you know, I'll sit and I'll go to their house and we'll get under the blanket and we'll cuddle and we'll watch a movie, a boring movie, but we're not going to do anything. And then you get there and the wine's flowing and the mood's right. And they're saying all the right things. And well, maybe just this one time or, uh, well, we didn't have sex. We just did oral or I just, we just used our hands. And it's like, the fact that you guys are putting yourselves in those situations and going that far, it tells me that there is a lack of self-control. There's lack of awareness. There's a lack of discernment and there's a lack of maturity spiritually. And you probably shouldn't be, you are not ready to be in relationship. Nobody wants to say it. And then we, we, we tie this neat little bow and says, Oh, well, this is my person. Well, I'm going to marry him anyway. And then you guys do this little song and dance for a year. Nobody ever gets married and you've given yourself away. You've poured all of that out that was reserved for the person, like your, your, your spouse, your marriage partner. You've poured all of that out into somebody else. And now you leave with trust issues and baggage. And now you're broken and you can't, you, you don't believe anybody. And now you're hurt and your walls are up. And rather than focusing on your relationship with God and establishing a baseline of friendship, now you, you're, you're left even more broken. Like, uh, you know, and this is crazy that this is for adults. I'm talking to adults mainly here, um, adults who are still having these relationship issues in and out of them, giving themselves away, jumping into these things. And these are adults who say that they're Christians, that they have a relationship with the Lord, that they're praying about these things. And it's like, are you? Uh, because prayer also requires listening. Prayer isn't just you talking to God and laying out this laundry list of wants and desires. You got to listen. And too many of us are walking onto these construction sites and ignoring the signs, ignoring the warnings, not putting on the proper protective equipment before walking into the situation. So Song of Solomon, again, is about marriage. It's about love. It's about sex and intimacy and passion and 
hyping each other up and being there for one another, but it's also reestablishing like that is reserved for the bounds of marriage. Stop, stop, stop giving yourself away for a steak, for a, a surf and turf platter, you know? A surf and turf platter. Some of y'all go out and get a nice steak and some scrimps and maybe even some asparagus or broccolini, a nice glass of wine. And next thing you know, you're cuddled up to somebody you barely even know. Giving yourself away for a surf and turf. That's crazy. That's wild. A surf and turf? But you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Know your value. Know your worth. Surf and turf. That's crazy. That's actually crazy. Look, this is what we do in Royal City Church. Um, my encouragement for you as we're in the middle of the month of April is to save, S-A-V-E. Uh, and that is this, share the gospel or your testimony with at least one person this month. You guys, there's uh, a couple hundred people on here through TikTok, Instagram, or TikTok, YouTube, and the different platforms that we're streaming on. Um, if we all would share the gospel or our testimony with one person a month, that's a couple hundred people potentially giving their lives to Jesus. Uh, the A is attend four Bible-based community events. Look, if you're not in Inglewood in Los Angeles, I want to highly encourage you to get yourself connected to a local body, a body that can better serve you. Um, online is great. I love what we do here online, but there are limitations to this. And there are things that I cannot do. I cannot hold you accountable online because I pour into you and then I go about my life. Uh, and one thing that you're missing is that accountability that takes place in the local church. For too long, we've used because of the pandemic and, and rightfully so, we use online ministry as a, a vehicle to get people into relationship with the Lord. And it's been amazing for guys and gals. The, the pandemic's over. Churches are open. Um, you're only going to get so much of this. If you're not in our church physically, get yourself connected to a local body where they are doing Bible based community events, whether that's small groups, whether that's Sunday service, whether that's like like uh, uh, maybe it's a men's or a women's fellowship. Get yourself connected. It is so, so, so important. We are not in competition with 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 other churches or we shouldn't be maybe other churches feel that way. But here at Royal City Church, we meet the first, third, and fifth Sunday. And you know what I encourage people to do if we're not together? To either get themselves in a community Bible-based event or go to another church. Um, not because I'm fearful that they're going to be taken away. They're not, they're not my people. These are God's people. Uh, this is God's church. This is God's city. And he might connect them with somebody there who can better connect with me. But uh, the accountability piece and portion, you know, we had somebody on here who was upset. I don't know why, um, because I'm not here every day. I, I don't understand. But uh, I would encourage anybody who is not here at this church to get yourself into a church. Attend, attend. That's the AV is volunteer anywhere at least once a month. Today, we have a um, uh, an outreach that we're doing. We're getting together and putting together toys and diapers and essentials for kids, and we're donating them to the Alexandria House here in our local area. And so I would encourage you, it doesn't have to be a faith-based uh, event or a faith-based organization. Just get out and serve. Volunteer at least once a month. Find a place. Go to a, a, a shelter where there's animals. Go pet the puppies and play with the kittens and uh, clean up the poop, feed them. I don't know, um, but serve. I believe that we were made to serve. And then the last one is eat a meal with somebody who's close to you, but far from Jesus at least once a month. Um, talk with somebody who's not saved and don't go just to walk them through the Lord's prayer. Um, go to listen, right? Go to listen. There is something powerful and it helps us stay connected with what's going on in the world when we stop isolating ourselves from the world and we plug ourselves in with people who are lost and seeking. Uh, I have a better understanding of what's going on in the lost sinner's life because I am intentional about sitting with them without sinning with them. 
I'm not going out to the club and yeah, what's it like to be a sinner? No, I'm intentionally taking somebody out to a coffee in a public place and I'm allowing them to talk and to share what it is that they're going through, what they're wrestling with, so that I am better in tune with what's going on in their heart. And now I'm a better evangelist, minister, and pastor because I understand what the lost are going through. We get saved and we remove ourselves from when we were lost. And as time goes by, we get more and more disconnected. And what happens is we start to get higher and higher on our Christian little high horse. And now we start to point our nose down. We start to look down our nose at those lowly sinners and low lives when we were them just months or maybe even years beforehand. So uh, I encourage you to, to save every month. This is your monthly reminder. And then our schedule, just so you guys know, we're preaching in North Hollywood. We've got our Q&A on uh, Tuesday morning, 5.30 a.m., women's group, Tuesday night. Thursday, we have our throwback Jeep video. We have a Thursday night Bible study. And Saturday, we will be going through Isaiah's chapter 1 through 6. Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's pray. So, Father God, we thank you. Lord, the praise, glory, and honor belong to you and you alone. God, we can't do this without you. Uh, marriage is hard, but God, so is divorce. Um, relationship is hard, uh, but so is loneliness. Lord, there's so many different aspects in our life where we struggle and strive, but we know that you are the answer to all of our problems. Uh, help us to deepen our intimacy with you. God, help us to go deeper and to have a better understanding of who you are and, and what you want and who you want for us. Lord, help us, for those of us in marriage, to hype each other up, to use our words and actions to compliment and lift up our spouses. Lord, help us, uh, those of us who are single, um, to really enjoy the process of establishing uh, a friendship with those who you may desire us to enter into relationship with. Uh, God, help us to slow down, to be patient, and to really test the fruit, to, to really make sure that the people we're pursuing are who they say that they are. And God, our prayer is that you would expose any unrighteousness, that you would expose any uh, bad intentions, that you would expose anybody and everybody who is misrepresenting who they are. Lord, show us their heart. God, we judge on outer appearance. It's easy for us to overlook uh, some of the red flags and signs that you're revealing to us. But God, help us to slow down and, and to take it all in. And, and, and when doing so, God, help us to be obedient, not just to see the signs, but to heed to the signs, to obey the signs, to pump the brakes, to step back, to reevaluate, and to use the discernment of the Holy Spirit before entering into relationship. God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the Song of Solomon. We thank you for the, the, the boundaries and guidelines of marriage that you've created for us to enjoy uh, the spouse that you've chosen for us, that you've placed in our path. Uh, God, help us to live this word, not just read it, not just know about it, but to actually live it. God, to you be the glory, praise, and honor. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and by the power of his blood. Amen and amen. Uh, I want to just quickly say thank you to Kim, Marie, Miss J-Rod, Melanie, Inge, and Gloria. Thank you, ladies, for your generous contributions and donations. It's a blessing to Kyra and I. I appreciate you. Um, but hey, I hope that you guys have an amazing rest of your day. I look forward to seeing you all back here in one week uh, next Saturday, 6 a.m. If I don't get a chance to see you at church this Sunday. Um, until next time, you guys have a good one and uh, we'll see you later.